That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 113 of That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. Posting on the 4th of November 2022. I am Conal O'Moran. Yet again, great feedback from someone who heard Dr. Brian Penny on episode 101 and asked him to address their business group. And this guy phones me and says, incredible, incredible, incredible. Listen back to episode 101 if you want to know what all the fuss is about. On this episode, if your business worries are stopping you sleeping, we have a company whose pillows may help. We're also joined by an Ironman who, when he's not running up mountains and jumping into freezing lakes, he continues to expand his business offering. And space, the final frontier, we bring you what I think is a first, a space economist who may tell us how to make money out of space, as in the dark stuff, in the sky kind of place. And who brings you all these great business insights? De facto shaving oil does. Long fingering, the curse of business, do it now. Like buying stocking fillers. De facto shaving oil, the world's best shaving oil, is the ideal stocking filler. For men and women, it's the best anyone can get. Buy it now on defactoshave.com and you'll have short fingered something. And I bet you that's a first. Then sit back smug in the knowledge that you have bought friends and family something they'll actually value. DeFactoShave.com Do not like us, but do share us. Press the share button on LinkedIn so the whole wide world will know you listen to quality podcasts. It's good for us too, of course. You can also send the link on WhatsApp to your buddies in business. The other day I was an MC at the New Frontiers event in Dublin where I met an ex-Twitter employee. We discussed the current situation with layoffs at that company and others and he told me he took a package during a previous redundancy program and he now runs his own a very successful startup so good things can come out of tough times. Similarly, my next guest used to work with Google and struggled to get a good night's sleep, surviving on five hours sleep a night or even less. Her sleepy struggles led to her setting up a business, Siest, that makes sleep-related business products, including the Siest Sleeper, a weighted pillow. The very well-rested Sheena Dunn joins me now in studio. Sheena, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Tell me about your struggles with sleep. I sound like Dr. Somebody, doesn't I? You, it sounds like I'm in a wonderful therapy session, actually. Um, my So I was not sleeping properly, but also I didn't think it was bad enough to need to go to a sleep consultant. So I think I was sort of what most people are. You have I had young children um, working a big job, um, my husband working a big job too, and sort of general anxiety and not sleeping. So I was going along doing this um, until I heard a sleep consultant And they came in to talk to us at Google. And actually that day has changed my entire path of my career because from that session, I was able to learn, learn about sleep. I couldn't believe how little I knew about it. And I also didn't know how bad it is if you don't sleep well. So from that day, that was 2019, I started learning about it. I started studying and researching all about sleep. And then it wasn't until 2020 when I decided to leave Google that I came up with an idea of the CS Sleeper. The idea of leaving came first? Yes. Isn't it funny? There is Google doing its best trying to you know, get its staff to sleep and they actually get the staff out the door setting up a business. It's kind of ironic. Maybe. It was Google actually has sleep pods, which was pretty cool. So I used to take advantage of those during the day. Um, so you did get your sleep. This is now, <laughs> your whole story is unravelling. <laughs> I got it at the wrong time, though. So I um, yeah came up with the idea then in March 2020 and started creating the product in my garden and uh, developing the CS Sleeper, which it's now known, which is the first ever weighted sleep pillow. So it's like a long body pillow, but it's weighted. So it gives deep pressure like a weighted blanket, but also something called proprioception, 
which is that wonderful sense of being grounded where you feel really comforted. And most importantly, you're able to get out of your head and into your body quickly. Points of Guinness do that as well. <laughs> they do. And a lot, of, actually, it's funny you say that because a lot of people self medicate for sleep. And there's a lot of stories recently in the papers about how people are having more alcohol because it does help you sort of pass out, but it's more sedation as opposed to quality sleep. And you said that you started making these in your back garden because our little pre chat that we had, I was wondering, you know, where in China or wherever do you have these made? And then you corrected me because what is the correct answer? So they're all made by my team in Dublin. and That is fantastic. I think like we don't manufacture in this country, as you know, mm -hmm. except for making sleep pillows. Yeah, well, it's true. So mass market products as well are rarely manufactured in Ireland. And I think this was nearly the, one of the benefits of the pandemic because I knew lead times would be far too great if I was to ship it somewhere else. And so it's five kilometres. It was literally within my 5K radius. So I was able to go and uh, work with my team and... We built the prototypes, had them out being tested all during all the lockdowns. How do you test a sleepy pillow? You get some people who want to sleep and you <laughs> give them the pillow. And how do you measure it though? I mm -hmm. mean, do they psychosomatically say, God, I really feel better now? Mm -hmm. Or what is the measure, the real measure? Real measure. So in, initially it was really uh, anecdotal. Um, but then last year um, I got an innovation grant from Enterprise Ireland and worked with Trinity College to do an independent research on the products. And we worked with children with mild sensory challenges and the measures were sleep latency. So that is your ability to fall asleep in 30 minutes or less and then sleep awakenings. There's nothing wrong with waking up at night and it, it's really normal, um, but you don't want to be doing it sort of 10, 15 times a night if it's disturbing your quality sleep. So sleep awakenings were the second measure and the third measure was sleep quality. So this is subjective and is anecdotal, but it was a combination of the parents and the children uh, feeding back. So those three measures we studied and the results were amazing. So the um, results for sleep latency was 133% improvement in ability to fall asleep in 30 minutes or less. And the benefit of being able to fall asleep quickly is it reduces the time you spend in bed having anxiety. And the more you overthink in bed, the worse your sleep can get it. Everybody knows this. So sleep latency is actually really important. I am your worst nightmare, get it? Sleep. <laughs> because once I see the pillow, not your pillow, mm -hmm. any pillow, I'm asleep. Brilliant. And then I pop it. Exactly. So how big is the problem? Mm -hmm. What is the, what, what do they call it, the addressable market? Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, even on waiting lists for sleep studies, there's about 100,000 people in Ireland. Oh my God. So these are people with, they have gone to their doctor, they have gone to try and see a sleep consultant and they're currently on a waiting list. Um, 100,000 in for, Ireland? For CPAP machines. Hang on, for, I have to check now. Lee, Lee is our sound engineer. Lee, any problems sleeping? Yes, he does. Lee yeah. does. Immediately we found yeah. one other person for you. There's another sales for you there. So, And that's just from the sleep apnea side. So um, my products are more mass market, so they're useful for anxiety um, and when you are over overthinking. So it's a much larger market than and that. And you have, as you are saying just now, a mass market product once I hear that term, it says to me that anybody, Walmart, Dunn Stores, somebody can come in and swoop up your lovely idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there's pros and cons to having a competition. So I have a recently been granted the patent, the innovation patent uh, in the UK. For what? So the out outside of the product is trademarked. So the design and logos and things like that. But the patent is actually for the internal part of the product. So what appears to be something really simple, how we manufacture it and how we've designed it internally makes it into a really unique product as, as agreed by the UK patent. Um, and patent. how do you manufacture it? So everything is cut on a bias and this... I know what that means, you know. Great. Uh, so the difference, I suppose, when you hold a weighted sleeper, so one of the CS sleepers, if you hold it in your arms... There's a difference between something hugging you and you feeling hugged and supported. And it's the way the product is balanced that makes you instantly feel that you can breathe out and that you she's, can start relaxing. She, Sheena is closing her eyes as she's describing this. How did you measure? How did you... The process for all of this is fascinating. Because I can see, you, I can see your arms almost going around this product mm -hmm. in your head. Mm -hmm. How did you do all this? 
So I love problem solving and I had never designed a product before. And literally every day I have new problems to solve. Like, how do you create a prototype? How do you get something manufactured? I contacted about 150 different suppliers to manufacture the product in the way that I wanted. So my drive to help people sleep, but to ensure that it's the right product for them um, is what motivates me every day. And your RRP, your recommended retail price for this product is? 190 euro for the short sleeper and 250 euro for the large. So it's chunky, Mm -hmm. but it's going to solve a problem. So it's priced really well if you look at, um, say, a silk pillowcase, which is basically for three rows of stitching and is uh, about 90 euro. What the sleeper will get you, which is a, is a handmade product in Ireland. Oh, I see what you've done there. You're comparing it with the silk pillow yes. because some people say if you sleep on a silk pillow. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I what, don't have one of those. What either. the weighted sleeper will do is it's it's um, wrapped in a washable um, tensile, but it's lensing tensile. So we, we're we working as an ethical business and also our products, are our materials are sustainable. Um, so we use lensing tensile, which is as soft as silk, but more robust. And really crucially for sl- sleep is it stays cool. So children sleep hotter and so do women. And what we wanted was something that would work for these two really specific markets. And if you are, you, you're manufacturing in Ireland, is your market Ireland or have you gone international with it? Right now it's Ireland. And in 2023, in Q3, we'll oh, be Q3, going... Oh, Q3, I was going to say, because 2023 is only a few weeks yeah. away. So in Q3, we'll be uh, moving more into Europe and... And why so specifically Q3? What, have you, what will you have done uh, before heading into, as you say, Europe? So Q3 is a good time to launch because it's not the busy season. It's not Q4, which would be insane to launch in a new market. Um, it'll give us time to test and trial and work with our distributors. And you're going to sell online or are mm-hmm. you going to try to get into... Bricks and mortar, pure? So I want to sell online. And the reason for that is we can uh, reduce our overheads. So they are uh, handmade products. They are using incredible um, materials. But again, this, and they do give huge value for people to help them sleep. But we want to be able to ensure that the price doesn't escalate. But let let us say, and I hope it is, a massive success. Say you're shipping a thousand a day. Is there any way that you can actually manufacture a thousand a day in Ireland? These are wonderful problems to have. And these I know. are. Uh, I'd love you to have this problem. So I've actually already talked to companies in Europe um, and matched prices uh, with our um, team here. And what's amazing is a handmade product, actually, the ability to get it done for a lower price point is very hard, actually. So so that's going to protect you on, if I like, on the downside. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what about other and I uh, love this kind of stuff, but I don't think people like talking about this, is uh, other products. Mm -hmm. What else is coming down the line? So we are passionate about sleep. I'm currently studying um, sleep medicine in University of Oxford at the moment. And um, so I'm doing modules, various modules, and I love it. What did Um, that give you eventually? PhD in sleep? So if I did it all the modules, I could get a master's. but I think what for me as a business person, I'm really keen to be able to um, hold my own with the sleep consultants that I'm talking to. And I think it's just really important as a business that we're fully aware of the new research um, that's available. But what's next for CS, CS Sleep is um, education is uh, really important. Right now, sleep knowledge is very poor in Ireland and we are launching a national survey in Q2 next year, um, where we want to help benchmark uh, people sleep in Ireland. So the grant that I, I've got another grant to work with Trinity again, um, I'm delighted they want to work with me again. And we are going to create um, like a an approved study for uh, understanding Irish people's sleep. So that's one one angle. There was a best-selling book only, is it a year ago, maybe two years ago about sleep? I can't remember who wrote it, but it was an international bestseller. Mm-hmm. Sleep obviously is a massive, massive mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. It is. And sensory sleep products like the weighted sleeper are, we're only at the beginning of understanding them in Ireland. So in the States, this is a billion dollar industry already. And over here... She said excitedly. (laughs) Over over here. Well, it's more that there's so many people you can help. And I think a lot of people now who are even on waiting lists, 
they're not even improving their sleep knowledge while and they're how waiting. are you going to get the CST story out to them? Now, you have a Google background and we discussed it and we, it is uh, you were in sales, so you know exactly what you're doing on trying to get into these people's heads via Google. Mm-hmm. Is that your route to market? Google's amazing. Um, I think a lot, a lot of the online platforms are incredibly useful. Um, in Ireland, traditional media is really strong, as you'd know. So radio, television, press is actually really strong in Ireland. Podcasts. And podcast. podcasts, podcasts, podcasts obviously. Very, very I love podcasts. <laughs> um, so traditional media is actually really strong in Ireland. And what I'm getting is word of mouth. So um, there's two sides. There's word of mouth for um, the consumers who buy directly from cssleep.com. And then there's also the expert side. So I'm currently working with menopause consultants, sleep consultants, physios, occupational therapists, who are then recommending. Um, What's interesting is more larger pharma companies who currently sell quite medically looking products are getting in touch with me. So uh, I don't know where those conversations are going to go currently, but um, it's it's a really nice place to be in. It is a bulky item to ship. Yes, it's heavy. So on post or whoever, whomsoever must love you. Yeah, DPD, they do. Because on mm-hmm. top of the sales price, I presume, there's another 30, 40, 50 quid to pay for shipping? So we currently cover shipping for consumers. Uh, you learned that from Google, didn't you? Yeah, because... because you give me the inclusive price and I feel you're doing me a favour. Exactly. How weird is that, that we actually think by paying more money that you're doing me a favour? I love that. Well, it isn't as high as 30 or 40 anyway, though. So DPD, I've negotiated a really good deal with them because they're actually trying to promote small businesses, which is nice. And to ship and to ship and to ship, how many are you going to ship in Ireland? And what about the UK? Yeah, You didn't mention UK yet. No, so originally we were going to go into the UK, but I'm not currently now. Is that Brexit? Yeah, definitely. They're mad. I keep saying it mm. here. They have done themselves so much damage. Mm. Would you not just even be tempted? There are 50, 60 million people in the UK. But there's so many wonderful Europeans we can target first. Okay. Yeah. And each one of them, it does, just again, since you know so much about sleep suddenly, is that uh, are there countries who are better at sleep, worse at sleep? Who sleeps best? Who sleeps best? The people who don't try, I think, are the people <laughs> who sleep best. No, like, as, yeah. in, as in with ethnicity, as in countries, who's uh, the Spanish people or Italians? That's a great these? question. I don't know, actually. Okay, no. that's one of your I'd modules now. I'd say it's the blue absolutely. zones, but I... I, I the uh, blue zones, what are they? You know the blue zones in the world, so the no. the areas where people live longer and happier and have more purpose and greater sense of community. So they sleep better? They will. You're imagining, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'll come back to you on that. Definitely. But please do. I will. Please do. I will, definitely. So what can uh, Team GBS, that's our lovely listeners, what can they do for you? Value your sleep. That's the most important thing. So people are always looking for different sleep hacks. And for me personally, as Sheena Dunn, and for my business, cssleep.com, value your sleep and start prioritizing it. And check out c-s-t-s-i-e-s-t sleep.com and have a look around there that you said that there are I'm going to let you have a little ad here now there are two products discuss so tell we, the world how wonderful they are we have two ranges one is a soft sleeper and one is a firm feel the firm feel sleeper is more for a positional tool so to help with side sleeping for sleep apnea and it's more robust the sleep apnea, don't tell me that you can cure snoring as well. So one of the recommended um, suggestions by sleep consultants is to sleep on your side for sleep apnea and for snoring. So the CS sleeper is a positional tool to aid with that. And what's really nice is it doesn't look like a medical product. It's really beautiful. So people leave it on their bed. So what the consultants say is useful is it product adherence is really high because you can have a million things to help with your sleep, but none of it matters unless you use it. So the CS sleepers, they lie in your bed and it's always there for you. That's the hard one or the... Yeah, exactly. That's nice our firm range. Exactly. Firm, sorry. And, and the soft one is for? So the softer range, it won't go flat if you place it between your knees. So it'll help um, there. And it's for holding in and helping, uh, as I said, to get out of your head and into your, into your body to relax you really before sleep. And it works? It does. How, fine, it has to be the, <laughs> almost the final question. How do you know that it relaxes you? I mean, it might relax you, but does it? how do you know? Well, that's why we did independent research as well. So in addition to all the customers, um, that's why we took the time to do that. Cool. All right. You know what our last question is? Who would Sheena Dunn hire in a heartbeat? 
It's such a great question. And Sharon Keegan, if you're listening, I would hire you Peachy Lean. Peachy Lean is an amazing company. They um, Not only are we aligned in our brand values and supporting women, but she has a gorgeous product. And I think she's such a visionary in terms of her operational skill and her strategic thinking. And I think I've had Sharon on the podcast twice so far. And prior to that, she was with me on radio a good couple of times. She is fantastic. Yeah. Brand values and everything. It's just a person, a can-do person. Absolutely. and that's No that's... silver spoon, just a lot of graft. And a lot. Peachy Lean is her product, but that's, we might actually get Sharon back in again to have a chat because I think she's up to more things. I think she's got a new range or something that I saw. She has a great pop-up actually in Dundrum. Here? Mm -hmm. Oh, she might even go down and have a chat with her. Sheena, Sheena Dunn, please come back to us when you're breaking into the European wide market. Do not give up on the UK, despite everything. <laughs> so a lot of people over there and they're next door. And I just think it's such a handy little market for you. Little, do you like that? Little market, <laughs> 60 million, 10 times this place. Sheena Dunn, founder of siestasleep.com. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. One of that great business show's biggest supporters is Mark O'Dwyer, founder of the Big Red Cloud Account software company. You hear his ads popping up in the pod every week. Now, Mark has some big news. Not the news that he's very recently triumphed at the World Ironman event in Hawaii. We all know that. But the big news is that Big Red Cloud will tomorrow launch the Big Red Web. Joining Mark to tell us more about what all of this means is Darren Costlow, who's been involved in the development of the Big Red Web, which I gather is a simple website and e-commerce builder and the first of its kind in Ireland to have integrated accounts software. So, what does that all mean for your business? Let us find out. Mark O'Dwyer and Darren Costlow, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks very much, Connell, for the introduction. That is the and voice of Mark, because you'll hear the voice of Darren in a second. Mark, let's just get the elephant in the room out of the way. Talk to me about the Iron Man. I said to you, uh, you've been on the show, I think, twice before, both the times I think I insulted you by saying, you're mad. What did you do to earn your Iron Man stripes in Hawaii? So I did my seventh Iron, full Iron Man in Copenhagen on the 21st of August. And by competing in that, I managed to get the right time and qualify for the World Championship six weeks later in Kona in Hawaii. And it has to have been the hardest race I've ever done. It was 34 degrees. 80% humidity and there were headwinds uh, for the first 95 kilometres on the bike and for no, a non-swimmer Tell me the distances you've oh, done Oh sorry the distance is a 3.8 kilometre swim a 180 kilometre cycle and a full marathon a 42.2 kilometre run all back to back and not being a swimmer finding out before the race that it was shark infested waters in the <laughs> North Pacific was quite a challenge mentally for me They might have put a century a little bit faster maybe well, they do say that if you're being chased by a lion, don't, as long as you're not the last person. But I'm a pretty slow swimmer, so I was a bit nervous about that. So, yeah. So, look, it was a lifelong dream of mine, uh, Connell. Uh, I'd spent 10 years at Ironman and I managed to achieve the goal and I am now retiring full from full-time Ironman. Do you, because we were just talking about sleep, do you sleep for uh, 48 hours after doing something like that? No, 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 because you've trained for it, so your body is prepared for what you put in front of you. Now, obviously, you can't train for the heat and what that will do to your body, but um, 
Hawaii was just about uh, completing the race, not about getting my personal best. And I was in absolute great shape, went back to the room, had a shower, had a burger afterwards, and then went back to the finish line for the, the later finishers to cheer them on. A burger? I'm oh, sure absolutely. You, I'm sure a leaf, a lettuce leaf or something would have been more apt. No, no, after <laughs> after the race, it's all over. Now I can eat what I want, so no, good. big juicy burger. Okay, good for you and congratulations. Thank well you very done. much. Okay, let's talk about the big red web. Darren. Wait till you hear this voice. Darren, tell us about the Big Red Web. How are you, Colin? <laughs> Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. Um, well, about two years ago, uh, I know Mark a long time, um, I approached Mark, um, liked the business, the Big Red Cloud. I liked the whole idea of being simple to use for business. And I said, I'm looking for an application for my own business, which is CMAT Hygiene. So we distribute and sell hygiene products. See the way he got the ad in already? Did that was good. That was very impressive. You better spell out that as I, well. I can't spell. Yeah. Well, it's CMAD, S-E-M-A-D, which oh, stands, said, for, oh, geez, doing it stands for Sean, Emma, Adam, my kids. <laughs> um, so I, I, I spoke to Mark. Uh, I wanted to use Big Red Cloud, but I needed stock. So Big Red Cloud didn't have that. I had to go to one of his competitors. Um, By stock, you mean you meant you needed to have some way of accounting for accounting your stock? Accounting for stock and dispatching stock and stock control, that type of stuff. Um, so I had to go to one of the competitors. Um, I dare well, you mention them. I won't mention them. No, 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 he's done Iron Man. I'm not going to. We're not here to promote them. Okay? <laughs> They're not paying you all the money I'm paying you for the advertising. <laughs> he's done Iron Man. No way. So um, anyway, I did that, but it still didn't suffice my needs as a business. So I was using an accounting application to run a business. And what I found was I was actually working my business around the application rather than the application in my business. So having looked at what was on the market, I couldn't find what I needed. So uh, as a small business, I got the sales team in, I got the logistics team, accountant, and I said, if we had a magic wand and we could create something that could actually enhance our business, both internally for ourselves and also our customers, what would we, would we do? So from a business level, we wrote down all the things that we needed. Uh, got those, I went back over to Mark. I said, Mark, I'd be very interested in doing something with you on the whole big red cloud. Um, you know, the brand is impeccable. It's simple, it's easy, uh, and it's Irish. So two years ago, myself and Mark sat down uh, with my youngest son, Adam, who's uh, um, just finished a master's in e-commerce. And we developed, uh, or we put together the spec for Big Red Web. And we spent two years developing it. We have our first beta site about five months ago. And I've been back and forth to Mark every month saying, Mark is ready to go. Mark being as impeccable as he is, saying, no, I want this, I want this, I want this. Um, so... Tomorrow, I'm delighted to say we're ready to launch um, Big Red Web. It is, um, I would call it a business management system because it, it, it touches nearly every point within a business. And if you look at large organizations, they have enough money and they have enough people to put in large, large systems. Smaller businesses actually need systems more than large business because we can't afford people. So that's what we've done. We've created a system that will enhance both the user experience for their customers and also automate internally within the organization. Well, take your business and talk me through exactly how you use it. You come in on a Monday morning, flick on the computer, and what starts whirring and what starts happening for you? Okay, well, it's 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 cloud-based, so I don't even have to come in in the morning. As soon as I get up, <laughs> have my breakfast, and look at the phone. Um, and hopefully I'll see some web sales. So this time last year, we had zero web sales. Um, and the reason we had that, because when we looked at, at developing a website, it was just so difficult to do and so difficult to maintain and so difficult to get content onto the website. So that was the, fir the, the first thing we did. So now we would have probably 30% of our customers ordering online and that's growing. Since when? Five months ago. 30%? That's yeah. a bit yeah. of a so, change, isn't so it? The part of the yeah. Big Red Web, that there's a key in the name, that it helps you design your website. So that's the first thing that yeah. Darren did because he wanted to go wanted to digital e and e-commerce. So, so but five months ago, he put the web up with yeah, the but 30%, web. that's a chunky change. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And a chunk of change. Maybe. It is a yeah. chunk yeah. of yeah. both. Yeah. So what we do is we would go, because hygiene products are recurring items. So if, if you buy tight roll this month off, you'll buy it next month and the month after, etc. So we go to our customer base and we agree the pricing with them. We look at the products that they want to buy. And then we set them up on the website and say, now, when you want to order something, just log in. There's all your products there. There's all your previous orders. There's your pricing. Select one of these, two of these, four of these, wherever it may be, press submit, and the following day then that goes out to you. So our salesperson is involved. There's no phone calls. There's no ambiguity about what they want. 
Um, and that was working really, really well. So that's what we do. That's the first thing we do, look at the, the web sales. And their customer pricing is all there available to yeah. so they can see exactly yeah. how much it's costing them. Yeah, yeah. And is that dynamic? It's dynamic. It's dynamic, yeah. Do you see the way I threw that in? I'm yeah. very impressive. You're a very smart guy, Connell. Thank you very much, Mark. This is going to go on for a while, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, one of the things is, it is specifically for my pals and the SMEs. Absolutely. That's exactly who we're going after. So, up to now, Bigger Cloud would have been uh, for the S of SMEs. And uh, this now brings in the M of SMEs as well as the S. So it's a mini ERP system for people who who need stock, who want to uh, help their customers more, help them engage with what they're ordering on a regular basis. And for the SMEs to take that step to make their company digital. And if it's just services and pictures that you want to put up on the web, we've something as simple as that. Or if you want to go the full-blown uh, system that Darren has where you're putting up products and giving each customer specific pricing and giving them the ability to order on, online, on the web, uh, it has that as well. And did I see that you have managed to manipulate it so that you can get your two and a half thousand quid grant as well? Correct. That pays for this. Yeah, yeah. the going digital grant from uh, from the local enterprise offices. That so many people still don't go and collect. Do you know that? And you know, it's, Connell, it's, it's nuts. You I don't can know get why. that every year. So, can you? I didn't know that. Yeah, so... so it oh, was, that's a good one. It was, yeah, during COVID, it was 100%. So yeah. they gave you the, the, the full amount of the website. Now it's 50-50 funding. But each year you want, because you got to remember, you got to keep working on this and, and enhancing your website and as things move and change. So each year you can go back to your local enterprise office who are absolutely superb. Right? And go back to them. And you say, better give your one a shout out. Which Fingo. one? Right? Fingo. Fingo, yeah. yeah superb. I've absolutely done some superb. work with them, yeah. Yeah, really, really good. So once you, now you've got to sit the TOV. Uh, uh, TOV? TOV, Trade and Online Voucher. Okay. You've got to sit the, the, the course, it's three or four hours. Again, very interesting. And um, once you've done that, you're entitled to 50% funding up to 5,000 euros towards your, your uh, digital journey. So that's 2,500 euros you can get from your yeah. local enterprise yeah. office. And that will get you on Big Red Web for three years. Get it. I was actually going to ask you how much, I know I was going to watch you squirm and try to get, avoid mentioning a price. No, I mentioned it, Darren, you'd ask. You'd put us in the spot. <laughs> so, so the, the I mean, basic, how much is it? The basic is? The basic from 19 euros a month. That is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I'm impressed. And then when you get up to the, you know, the quality stuff, the fancy stuff, yeah, how so, much is that? So if you want to, if you want to go bells online the with all bells and all whistles for three years, it's 5,000 euros, but you get two and a half thousand grand. 5,000 for three years. Mm. Correct. So it's 45 okay. euros a month. So and you go from, from 19 to 40. So, so the bells and whistles, okay? Yeah. So tomorrow morning, if you want to set up your website, your investment will be 45 euros. Okay. okay. How quickly? Can you, I'm sitting at home and I'm doing, I've got my little business and I need your business, your um, application. How quickly can I go from A to Z? How can I? Well, Darren I, did it, so. Okay, okay. So, if, so if we if we take, uh, it depends on content. Right? So, so obviously there's, there's depending on what industry you're in. So if we take uh, an IT reseller, for example. So we've integrated with all the IT uh, distribution companies in the UK, 180 of, of them. And if you're an IT reseller and you want to set up a business selling 10,000 products, it would take us 48 hours. You have a fully again. fledged e-commerce website, up. and is that using what is that a pointy or something like that, or you no. know when, when you're putting up photographs of all uh, like thousands of product that takes time. Yeah. So what we do is we we've integrated with content providers. So there's a content provider for IT, for example, called Stock in the Channel. Okay. So we have an API into those. We integrate into, in, into those, and every day they will send down a full file including images, pricing, description, etc. So you set it up once, you set your margin. You set up your customers and it works seamlessly in the background. And if you've shifted that number of customers online buying from you, does that mean that your customer base has suddenly increased? In other words, are you seeing more people coming to you because? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for two reasons. When they go online, they'll see more products that we can provide to them. Um, so we're seeing the add-on sell with the existing customer base. But also, our sales reps now have more time to go and visit new customers. And introduce them to what we do and so well, yeah absolutely it's, it's, it's been a real win-win and Mark 26 counties 32 counties or the world uh, so initially it'll be 26 counties and uh, sorry 32 counties because we our product is suitable to work in in the UK you can um, adjust for, for for sterling and everything yeah correct and the product is fully compatible with the HMRC and their uh, making tax digital requirements so because we have customers in the UK already uh, and then at some stage, we're looking to open up an office in uh, the UK to, to push it out there. Good man. When will that happen? Uh, probably next year. 
That's only eight weeks away, you know, or less, six weeks away. This time next year. <laughs> okay, cool. So the latest. Within 12 There's, months. <laughs> there are 250,000 odd SMEs in the country, I think. Of those, what's your target market for what you're doing? This, the, the web, the web, uh, red web. I love the name, actually, Big Red Web. Big Red Web. <laughs> actually, say it, Tara, because you've got the voice for it. <laughs> the Big Red Web. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> This is the uh, thing about I, podcast I, news, Mark, is I can talk away. Connell, Connell has the headphone on so he can hear Darren's voice. <laughs> I can only hear what Darren sounds like face to face. I was asking about the 250,000 odd SMEs. How big is your addressable market in the Republic? So uh, one of our multiple of the competitors that we don't want to mention here, uh, we have a product now that can actually enhance customers' experience and uh, get them to move over from our competitors. So the, the market is... Uh, there's about 90% of those 250,000 customers or uh, SMEs in Ireland are in our sweet spot. 90%? Yeah. Just going to be a bit busy. Yeah. Now, obviously, some of them have gone digital, but some of them have gone digital and they're using a provider for their web site and they're providing another, uh, or using another provider for their accounting system. So they have an issue. They have two different companies to ring. You have an issue or a question with us. You have one point of contact because it's fully integrated. It's the only one in the market that's fully integrated web and accounting backend. It all sounds pretty good. So what's next? Is there Are there further enhancements that you can come up with? Absolutely. Yeah, we're working on them all the time. Oh, yeah, come so, on, Tier, tell yeah, us. Yeah, I wasn't so, expecting this. I didn't know. Well, yeah, absolutely. So, so each month, uh, I spoke with the magic wand. So each month we have a magic wand meeting and we go through it and say, okay, and we speak to our customers and we speak to our, our staff and say, what's the next magic wand moment? Um, and... Where in a business are, are people consuming their time? So one of the areas that we're really looking at is the whole area of, of the purchase of product mm-hmm. um, because it's a, it's a very manual intensive process for, for an organization. So we're putting in um, sort of AI predictive, predictive purchasing. So we'll be able to, to based on the data that's in the, in the system, actually calculate going forward where, how many products you should purchase for your sales and your sales, sales to be met. Um, and for an SME, that takes away a big, big headache. That is lovely. All of this stuff, though, as you say, taking away all the mm. hassle out of my life. I was trying to use a website to buy a book recently. <sighs> Bad. An Irish bookseller. I won't name them, but not great. Not a good that's, experience. The other not thing, Connell, that, that's important as well from, from a web point of view is, be, is to be seen. You know, so it's, there's no point in having a great invention and lovely catalogs and leave them in, in your shed. You've got to get it out there. And obviously, spoken by a true businessman. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, with, with Google, Google are the masters, right? So you, you've, yeah. you've got to play to them. And Google keeps changing all the time. Like nobody would know the algorithms with Google. But one of the things they have, um, we're all familiar with Amazon, but Google have their own marketplace, which is the Google Merchant Center. And unless you're subscribing your products to the Google Merchant Center, it's very hard to get them ranked. And particularly when you're running Google AdWords, they'll charge you more. So with our system, we automatically, when you, when you put your product onto our site, it would automatically go onto Google Merchant Center as well. And it'll automatically do the meta tags for your search engine optimization without any work from, from, from anybody. I'm smiling to myself. If I were to ask you this three, four, five years ago about meta tags and stuff like that, would you have looked at me upside down and said, <laughs> what are you talking about? I would have called for the men the white coats come. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always love when we all move on and we learn and we say, yeah, 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 that's going to be really, really interesting. So final question, because you both know what I'm going to ask you, is I can't remember, Mark, who you hired in a heartbeat the last time. But uh, <laughs> did he uh, say? <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> no, Darren I, is pointing I, at himself. But uh, I who, said I suggested somebody that Darren used to work with before. <laughs> who would Mark? Who sorry? Who would Mark O'Dwyer this hire ta- in a heartbeat? This time round, I'd hire Tommy Kelly from e- e- oh, eShop yes. World because we're obviously we're on a a website, uh, Big Red Web Builder, and uh, Tommy uh, hailing from a North County Dublin farmer farming family uh, did a phenomenal job in internationalizing a business out of Ireland and uh, successfully selling it. So he would be my biggest hire. I have interviewed Tommy, not on the podcast for it, for IIBN, the Ireland International Business Network. What a nice man. Yeah, he's a really a dentier hugely guy. Hugely successful. Yeah. And he was offering me a lift home. It was wet. So he offered me a lift home. Very good. Yeah, lovely, lovely guy. And he's also now bought Sherry Fitzgerald. That's right. And I would watch that space. Yeah. I don't know. what he, I did ask him a hundred times what he's actually going to do with it, but um, we'll see. And Tommy, if you want to get involved with Big Red Web, just give me a shout. 
It's Mark M A R C at biggercloud.com. <laughs> <laughs> Always the salesman, Darren. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Ironically, my daughter used to work for Tommy in Heat Shop World. Um, I would hire, um, and I thought about this a lot, right? Good. I, would, I, would, I like that. I would hire um, a lady called Louisa Fanigan, right? And the reason I would hire is that pre COVID, she had a business, um, a business called NSI, which maybe get around sometime, Colin, which is Nail Systems Ireland. So it's nail and beauty. And she had a very successful distribution and training company. So she get people who were had nail bars and hairdressers, that type of stuff, and train them how to put the, the false nails on the line or not on the on the nails, that type of stuff. It was, it was a real bums on seats business because at the end of the course they had to examine the nails, how good they were, they get the certification. So COVID came along and obviously decimated that business. Um, but rather than sitting back and you know, and she didn't know IT, she she didn't know about Zoom or whatever. I'd say within two or three weeks she completely pivoted and created against everybody uh, 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 saying she couldn't do this, but it created a business that went online teaching people how to do something that was traditionally taught in a classroom and actually came out of COVID with a better business. I love And I just thought that resilience was superb. You know, it's not a well-known person, brand or name, whatever it may be, but for someone to do that. So that would be the person that I would. And I love that story. Because again, it comes back to people in business. I just love them because of that forever brain thing going, what's next? What's next? What's next? Mm. So mm. I presume, Mark, when you set up Big Red Cloud, you weren't thinking of Big Red Web. I wasn't. No, absolutely not. And there were several features within Big Red Cloud that we hadn't considered back in 2012 when we launched it in the first place. You better give a big final shout out. Anybody who wants to find you will find you at www. Dot Big Red Cloud. Nobody dot says com. www. Okay. Darren, Old tell school. them www. Can you edit that out? Oh, oh, Bigredcloud.com <laughs> forward slash Big Red Web. Nobody Sorry. says forward slash anything. They just okay. Google it. Bigredcloud.com <laughs> forward slash web. Cool. Thank you. Darren Costello, thank you so much for joining us. Mark Hochwar, congratulations again on your Ironman. And thank you so much for joining us and for backing us on That Great Business Show. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket, and your planet. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Backing great women-led businesses on every show. That great business show. We love finding you the unusual, the exotic, the different. And that's why we say we do business differently. For example, where else would you hear a space economist? Not a person as I first thought that was involved in property or construction economics. No, 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 no. Someone who seeks business opportunities in outer space. Sinead O'Sullivan is Professor of Aerospace Engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology and has worked with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy. So that's not a bad start. She is also a business economist, having worked for MIT Sloan and Harvard Business School. Her work focuses on the strategy, business and financing of deep technologies such as aerospace, computation, energy and infrastructure. Shinnett O'Sullivan, welcome to That Great Business Show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> I had you here because I've never, in all of my days, come across a space economist. What does a space economist really do? Well, you're not the first person and actually our, our initial email exchange was funny because you, you actually literally asked me about spaces and architecture. <laughs> which... <laughs> I'm honest, I open up to people, I say this is what I thought. 
<laughs> I mean, not, you know, I love architecture as, as a side, um, as a side thing, but no. Um, so really I, I do what, what you just, what you basically just said. I look at. But that doesn't mean anything to me that you, <laughs> uh, what does it say here? Focus on the strategy, business and financing of deep technologies. What does that mean? So basically, you know, let's, let's kind of zoom out and very, very broadly, um, what we're trying to do in the space uh, industry or within the space economy is, is, is build some of the big technologies and some of the ecosystem that we need. And Such as? Oh, okay. Uh, one of the exciting things that people are talking about at the minute includes space stations. And so you might say, ah, but there's already a space station. In um, space. There is a space there station. Is. Um, but that's actually going to deorbit soon. And NASA at the minute... Only current- American would say deorbit. Does that mean it's going to fall out of space? Or uh, out of the- <laughs> it's going to fall out of the sky? Uh, it's hopefully going to be a controlled orbit. I came across that phrase before uh, where they didn't say in, in America is to get off the plane or to disembark. They said to deplane. <laughs> you have heard that. So this is to that. deorbit. Okay, well, let's... We shall... Assume that the I, it is the ISS, isn't it? The it is the Space ISS. Station is going to deorbit, mm-hmm. and then there will be nothing. Then there will be nothing, except, except that the Chinese are going up and the Indians are going up, aren't they? <laughs> that is correct. You, well, you know, you know way more about this than you let on. <laughs> I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, one fun thing that we could do is that you tell me a story about the Chinese space station, and then I can tell you how accurate it is. <laughs> I have no idea. I probably read it on Twitter or something. And that's about as <laughs> the level of my knowledge. There are actually um, private company space stations uh, that are being proposed and worked on at the minute. And so this is really interesting because it used to be that the government uh, would would fund and execute on the space program more broadly in the US and in Europe. And now we're seeing that that's moving um, pretty much nearly all of it is moving over to the private sector. And so with that comes a whole host of different business models and financing needs that are very specific to the types of projects in the space industry. So starting, you know, if you wanted to start a space station startup, uh, the type of financing that you need is pretty different to, let's say, you wanted to create an app or some sort of software. I'd imagine by a matter of some zeros. Exactly. Yeah. These, These things aren't cheap. But an app, at least I can understand where, you know, there will be 10,000 users or a million users or whatever. Who is using space stations? Yeah, I know that people are trying to grow mushrooms or something up there, but I never, ever can get my head around as to a real business application that has made people money. In space, you mean? Okay, well, you know, if you look at, and you, you can do this, you can you can look at what happens on the space station at the minute. And I think you would be surprised, a lot of people would be surprised to learn that the space station, the research capability on the space station is actually booked up many years in advance. And the type of research that's being done at the minute on the space station that's really interesting for me, at least, is biomedical and biotech and, you know, looking at genetics and looking at different pharmaceutical combinations and and how things and, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, it could be bacteria, it could be mice, uh, you know, it could be anything, you know, testing different varieties of drugs or, you know, how things grow and shape and form in space. Now, is that a business, though? Because yeah, it is science, it's research. But is it a business in the sense that if I pay, say, take a number, 10 billion to put a space station up there, mm-hmm. there has to be a payback. Somebody has to give me a billion a year over 10 years just to get my money back. So there's two two interesting questions that I think you're asking. One is, is there any demand for these services? And the second is, at what price? And what then does this mean for the types of financing that that is required? So, you know, let's say it costs 10 billion to, and, and it, you know, th- those, I'm, I'm literally just making up that number. Some of the numbers that I've read are much lower than that. Um, this is the number that you've loaded, so let's use it. So 10 billion to put up a space station. Um, well, if you're a venture capitalist and you want 100x return on that, oh my God, I, you know, it's going to be tough to get that. That's what I was thinking. Exactly. So, so venture capital, it seems, is not the type of financing that a lot of these startups need. Um, and then it's tricky because, you know, what else is there? So you have private equity and, well, you, this is definitely not private equity financing, which is typically lower risk, lower reward. Um, 
you have public markets, and we've seen some SPAC, <laughs> some interesting SPAC activity in the space industry this year. And it turns out, you know, what we already know is true, that it's hard to build long-term projects that are very high risk in the public markets. And so this kind of leaves us asking the question, how do we start to build these big types of technologies? And is there a business in it? And, and so your first question, is there a business in it? I do believe, yes, that there is a business in it. Do I believe that it's going to be like, you know, there are 80 million different users? And no, I think the business model is very different to startups and specifically software. Um, but I do think given the early demand, I mean, look, I can only go on based, I can only go off based what a lot of the executives at the startups have been discussing publicly. Um, but all of them seem to be unanimous in that there is massive pent up latent demand for these types of services and that one or two or maybe even three space stations would not be able to f- sufficiently serve that demand now. Where do you think will the huge demand come from? Will it be medicine? Will it be agriculture? Will it be energy? Where oh, you're really, really knowledgeable about this. And I know that <laughs> well, I from would always you, use a disclaimer that you're very time. secretive. You're not trying to tell me anything. Or sorry, you're trying not to tell me anything. So where will the big demand come from? Yeah, I, I think it will kind of remain within the pharmaceutical um, medicine. And what's so great about doing things up in space if you're trying to make a drug? So I think, you know... It, Okay, so looking more broadly at material science, and that's why, you know, I think a lot of pharmaceuticals happens there, but we've also seen a lot of oil and gas and other kind of um, research, similar research done where where we look or where the underlying science is material science. So in, you know, kind of in low gravity environments, um, materials behave differently. And so you're able to separate some of the confounding um, characteristics of materials that are bound by gravity in uh, on Earth. So, so you can better understand different types of materials when you better understand their individual characteristics. You can start to manipulate and use them differently. Um, and so that's that's driving a large portion of of the research on the space station at the minute. Now, I you know full disclosure, I am not a biomedical engineer. I, I'm not a pharmaceutical um, expert, and so. You know, <laughs> but you're as close as I'll ever get to uh, people who hold the, have those qualifications and who really know the space. And actually, just as a matter of interest, how did you get into this area? Um, yeah, I mean, for you know, my journey into the space sector started. No, just say my journey into space. That sounds my even journey more, to that space. That sounds very impressive. <laughs> Trying to think of the the highest altitude that I've been, probably in an aircraft. That's that's the closest <laughs> I've been to space. Um, it, like a lot of my peers in the industry, it started when I was younger and just wanted to be either, you know, an astronaut or, or an engineer in the space industry. Where were you sitting when you thought that? Um, in, in Houston, Texas, actually. I went to space camp when I was younger and met a ton of astronauts. And You went to space camp? Like I went to... Uh... I don't remember what kind of camps I went to, but there certainly there were no astronauts. There might have been some spacemen, but they, in the, using the Irish phrase or Irish term for that, <laughs> space cadets. Um, yeah, well, I was also a space cadet when I was young. Oh yeah. What does a space cadet do? Well, no, I mean in the in the in the figurative oh, sense. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was sorry. away sorry. with the fairies. <laughs> but you didn't. You did not actually put on a helmet and uh, try to get up into a, uh, into an aircraft or a, into a <laughs> rocket or anything. So uh, you obviously you 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 worked your way up. So mm-hmm. what are the deep secrets that I'm not allowed to know that you're going to share with Team GBS or listeners about space and where they we're all in business. Mm-hmm. Where should they be looking at to make a few? pounds, dollars, euro, whatever, out of space. Well, I, so I'm going to paint this with a very broad brush. Uh, the space industry fits very squarely into the aerospace industry. And, you know, there's a famous saying that they typically use for airlines, but you could also <laughs> uh, use this for the space industry, that the fastest way to make a million is to start with 10 million. Um, it's a tough industry. And I think the interesting thing about this industry right now, like specifically this week and this month and maybe this quarter, is that, you know, we, if you look at the markets, we've just finished a very long, long bull run. And we're now starting to 
look at you know the reality of of investing and in growing large companies in the you know, with the presence of interest rates and inflation. And so, I think you know, in my mind, there are two space economies. If, if we're talking literally just about the business and economics of this, there is one one economy in which Morgan Stanley tells you this is going to be a multi hundred trillion dollar industry and. You know, we're all going to become billionaires. We, you know, invest in asteroid mining, and you could be a multi-trillionaire. And this is all just complete nonsense. Um, to be frank, uh, I, I just, you know, I don't subscribe to that uh, narrative of the industry. There is, however, another narrative and or another kind of space economy that is much more about business fundamentals and is driven by, you know, as as you're discussing, consumer demand market demand and and you know it needs to create some sort of profitability over the long term to be sustainable and you know the space industry is a very long term industry it could take you a decade to build a rocket and so then you you know you need to think about creating profitability in many decades not just 3 to 5 years as a venture capitalist needs for their portfolio so fundamentals are actually incredibly important in the space industry. And unfortunately, we've just kind of come out of a long market where fundamentals were largely ignored. And so I do think there are ways to make money in the space industry. Yes, we're getting <laughs> interested now. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's it's very difficult to look at the industry at large right now and to really specifically pinpoint those. Oh, um, I thought you were going to tell me the big reveal. Uh, well, to... no, I mean, like, look, you know, is it asteroid mining? No, it's not. Is it? Are, are there people really thinking of mining asteroids? Oh, or unfortunately. Is that just a, just a euphemism? No, unfortunately, yes. People, I mean, so two things. Yes, NASA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese, you know, most, most of the agencies and a lot of many, many research teams from universities and otherwise have been looking at this from an exploration perspective for and a long time. What is in these asteroids that's so valuable? Well, so from an economic perspective, and this is where it comes back to businesses, startups trying to chase this. Um, yeah, it, it's just, you know, it's, well, A, we don't really know. That's a good start. <laughs> so we're going to go mining, but we don't actually know what we're going to go mining for. Well, and we're also going to spend billions of dollars doing yeah. it. But if we find the one asteroid with all the gold... Um, you know what that means? <laughs> the gold market goes to zero. I know. Or it should be, but that's so, a different story. Yeah. So some some really smart people, like really smart people, have invested in asteroid mining startups and get away. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Larry Page was a big proponent. Okay. Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, he knows a thing or two about space. Yeah. So you kind of, you, you know. When you say they've uh, chucked money at it, I mean, these people are massively wealthy. Would they have put a billion in or? Oh, no, like a few million. Sure, that's only punting money. That's only pocket money for these guys. To Larry Page. Right, but they're still business people. I mean, <sighs> watch the pennies and the pounds take care of themselves, right? I think right? the pounds are well looked after now. In the case of Larry <laughs> Page, I think it wouldn't matter what he threw up there. there he'll still have cash. So <laughs> for me and for my lovely listeners, any opportunity at all that so, you would say, you know, keep a check on this one? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to mention individual company names, but some, because I'm not here to offer investment advice. Oh, well, we, we don't mind that. This is Ireland. We can do whatever we want. Uh, but I will talk about a sector that I find incredibly interesting, and that is of um, space in space and specifically traffic management and trying to figure out where anything in space actually is so that we don't collide into it. And this is kind of more broadly um, wrapped up in the whole indus- uh, the, the whole idea about space trash. And people say, well, there's so much space in space. It's- and there is though, isn't there? No, there really? isn't. Not useful space in because space. Because you have to go into an orbit, isn't that right? So right. you have to be far enough away, but not too far away, correct? And there are only a limited number of orbits. So I like to think of orbits as a natural resource that is finite, like water or trees or, you know, okay. whatever. Can and you buy an orbit? How about that? Yeah, you, you, oh, you, you can. cannot. One of the first... I could buy an orbit. Now you really got me interested. Well, so one of the first papers on the space, the business of space that I wrote in the economics of space was on the secondary market 
for orbit. So there's there's an active secondary market. <laughs> and I didn't know this. I know. Well, look. <laughs> how, much, how much does a good orbit cost? So it's, I don't want a second-hand one. I want a really nice new orbit. You, unfortunately, will not be able to get one. So oh, similar. Why? Okay. So, I, you know, I wrote recently about the art market. You know, you could be the richest person in the world and you could go to Sotheby's and say, hey, I want to buy that Picasso. And they could still say, no, we don't know you, even though we, we believe that you do have the, the financial capability to buy that Picasso. But hey, there's a long list of, of art collectors before you who are going to get that Picasso. And the same is kind of true in the space sector. But who owns it? I mean, who can say <laughs> no to me? So it is regulated and prices are set. By, by whom? By the, the, so there's a kind of global telecommunications agency called the ITU. And they, yeah, they they have been tasked with orbit, I guess, regulation. And if I were deemed to be a suitable person, which I am, <laughs> I believe. How you. much <laughs> would it cost me to buy an orbit? I love this. I, this is so nuts. How much would it cost <laughs> me to buy an orbit? Um, probably more than than. I mean, I know I know nothing about your personal. <laughs> Just we we'll say billions. So you know, I, I have billions. It's not really about the money, although they are expensive. So it's Put about. A on it. I, you know, I. It really, I can't. It, it, it varies wildly, and, and it's, it's, it's more than putting a, a price on it. So you have to. The process to secure an orbit is actually quite complex, and so you have to register certain satellites, and you have to know what satellites are going to be there. So you would have to create, in essence, a, a small space program to be able to file an application for that. So let's say that, you know, it costs you, I don't know, a million to build a satellite and then you have to then file paperwork and it takes a while. And okay, if you wanted to do it, you could probably do it for 10 million uh, for, for, for a decent one. But, but you know, then you have launch costs and insurance and other, there's, there's a whole industry around this. So I could buy for 10 million quid, I can have my own orbit. God, I'm really just making up numbers here. <laughs> <laughs> Most people you wrote don't. a page of about say a, a paper on this. So was so, it peer reviewed? Well, most people don't <laughs> buy uh, like so. You don't buy an orbit. It's kind uh, of like a parking spot in an orbit. So your satellite will. This is terrible. I was hoping that I'd have an orbit. Now you're just telling me you're going to have oh, a no, parking God, spot. No, you could not get a whole orbit. No, 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 no. Okay. So although although startups have have tried to do that. So recently we had the uh, the Rwandan Space Agency. Um, obtain. I, I you know I, I, I'm nearly sure they obtained an entire orbit that they're then selling on the secondary market to to startups that are trying to get their satellites into that orbit. However, it, it's wildly complicated and regulated, and you know, it's yeah, it's more complicated than just. <laughs> I think we are going to have to have you back on to that great business show for an, uh, maybe a satellite special or a, um, <laughs> a space orbit. special or something. Yeah, special. Because this is, I never knew about all this orbit stuff. So you know what the final question is that we ask all our guests. We mm -hmm. ask them, who would Sinead hire in a heartbeat? We don't ask all of them, Sinead. We, that word is um, changed. But we do ask our guests, who would you hire in a heartbeat? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't, you know, um, certainly not Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with poor old Elon? Yeah, no, we don't have enough time to get into that. Okay. I do. So, Elon, like, your history. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can cross him out. Um, because I'm sure Elon would love to work for me. You know, that's that's something I'm sure he'd be into. Um, we never ask people, would people work for you? That just might actually start to, that might be a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Who would you hire? So I am really big on young people in the industry, right? Um, I mentor a lot of people and genuinely believe that most of them are better than I will ever be. And so I'm actually really excited when I think about like, who would I love, love, love to work with? It's not, it's never like an established person. It's always like, oh, this undergrad that helps me with this project. They were really fun. And I just think they're going to be, you know, the next big thing and whatever. And so I, yeah, I'm working at the minute with a ton of younger people who are really exciting and 
you know, I, I really hope they they actually work with me in the Give future. Give me a name. because One name? Okay. There's a Mary or a John <laughs> out there. You say, they are so bright. Okay, I'll give you, I'm, you've, you know, my back's against the wall here. Okay, there's a guy called Craig um, that is a superstar. And I actually, Craig, what is her name? Sinclair. Sinclair. And I mentored him when he went to space camp. And many years later, he reached out to me and said, hey, I am a fully formed adult now. And I'm actually an economist with a training in physics. And I was like, wow, okay, there's a lot that we can do here. I was hoping you were going to tell me he was an astronaut. It's far more exciting. Not yet. No, what he's doing is way more exciting. Than an astronaut. Mm. I think so. I think so. <laughs> I've just dissed your entire business or your <laughs> entire training. Sinead, it's lovely to meet you. I, I still am trying to figure out, I cannot remember where I actually came across you, but I think you said to me that you write for the I currency. I write for the currency, yes. Okay, and I maybe think that's you where I saw you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fabulous. People and what they do. That is Sinead O'Sullivan, Professor of Aerospace Engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology and so many other things. And that is also it from That Great Business Show, episode 113. Please do make sure to press the share button on LinkedIn and do it now, please, before you forget, because we all forget because we're all busy. Send the podcast link to your pals and business as well via WhatsApp. They'll be very impressed with our list or your listening choice. Your business should advertise with us. That's a given. Give me a shout on LinkedIn if you'd like to know more. We record at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. Today's Mr. Big on the Buttons is sound engineer Lee Brennan. And later on, Neil Horner will add that extra sparkle to us in post-production. All that attention to detail is why we always sound so sweet. And if you would like to uh, record a podcast, do contact Peter Rice, the manager here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. And do check also our new legal podcast, The Fifth Court. You'll learn a truckload about the law from barristers and presenters, Peter Leonard and Mark Tottenham. And we may be announcing the launch of more podcasts like The Fifth Court that we're involved in in the near future. And if you'd like your own podcast, do have a chat with us. We bring it to another level. And all our great business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. Because they back us, please back them. De Facto Shave com will get them. And do not forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have a regular column all about the podcast. From me, Conal O'Mora, Mila Boychus, for listening. Agus <laughs>